So Dr. Janice Gosnell, we're super lucky to have her here with us today. She's the Chief Data Science Officer at DataStax, which is a data management firm that leverages NoSQL technology for data storage. Dr. Gosnell's career centers on her passion for graph data, an interest that was sparked by a chance encounter during her first year of her master's program at East Tennessee University. Throughout her subsequent doctoral studies at the University of Tennessee and her impressive career in the healthcare and data management fields, Dr. Gosnell has patented, built, published, and spoken on dozens of topics related to graph theory, graph algorithms, graph databases, and the applications of graph data across a variety of industries. In April, Dr. Gosnell published the Practitioner's Guide to Graph Data, which was co-authored with a colleague at DataStax. So we're super lucky to have her. Um, I want you to all to give a big welcome to Denise Gosnell, uh, joining us today to speak on the power of graph thinking. Awesome, thank you guys so much. I'm so glad to be here. I, uh, we've been we've been planning this one for a while, and I'm so glad that it's finally here. Um, you guys have an incredible crew of folks uh, organizing this. I already hopped into your Slack channel, so uh, I'm looking forward to today and this discussion, and then also kind of following along and finding out how I can continue to support your efforts. So thank you guys so much for the warm welcome. I I absolutely love questions, conversation, discussion. If it's on your mind, in my opinion, you should ask it. Uh, so as we go along, use the chat, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, you know, I, I, I tend to talk, uh, chat a lot. So if you're concerned that you're going to interrupt me, well, I welcome you to. But if you're super concerned, I'm also going to follow the chat. So I've got a few monitors here uh, to make sure that I get your questions in as we go. Uh, so I, I do hope that we make this as uh, interactive as you all hope. We've got a global audience. So grab your beverage of choice uh, and uh, let's have fun today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen if that's all right. And then yeah, of course. let me know if you all can see the slides. Yeah, I can see it. Great. And then one second as I bring the chat back over here, because with that, uh, the Zoom chat disappeared, but I think I have it back now. All right, awesome. I also dropped a link in Zoom chat if you all want to follow along on your local hosts. Uh, there's a ton of graph pictures, graph databases, and graph theories, extremely visual. Uh, so if you do want to have them uh, to see locally, you're welcome to use them. Uh, there, there is some personal information about me on these slides. So this is a, something that you all are welcome to use, but please don't recopy uh, and use them elsewhere if you, if you, don't, if you don't mind. Uh, so what we are going to do for the next, uh, it looks like probably 75 minutes or so, maybe about an hour. Uh, first off, I hope to answer your questions and make this as interactive as possible. Because uh, if we have 60 minutes go by and it's just me, that's going to be really boring. <laughs> so uh, I please, uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Uh, what we, we talked about doing three things today. I'm going to start off at the front uh, talking a little bit about who I am and uh, kind of spending a little bit of time doing the timeline view of my career and how I ended up to where I am today. The second two pieces are going to dive into how I see the, the data industry and the data space and where graph databases, graph thinking, graph theory, and all this really sweet data analysis kind of is becoming an emerging topic in the industry. So we're gonna go from career discussions into talking about why now, why are we gathered here on a Saturday to talk about graph data and graph thinking. And then the last section is what I like to call navigating the tech water cooler. If you happen to be new to graph databases, graph theory, or any of these graph topics, I wanna go through the three most popular subsections of this emerging field in the data analytics space and give you a, just kind of like that vocabulary tour so that as you're going about and doing additional research or having a conversation with somebody in some random Slack channel, since we're not really navigating actual water coolers these days, uh, I, I wanna empower you to have the basics of what is exciting about the graph, uh, graph database and graph technology that is coming out uh, so that you can decide what you might be interested in and have that conversation and go a little bit deeper. So does that sound okay for you guys? And I can't see any of you, so hopefully uh, someone can let me know if this, if this looks good. Sounds great. Sure. Awesome. Awesome, thanks guys. Uh, as they mentioned, I recently authored a book. The way I think of it is that I poured my heart and my mind onto these 409 pages. It was a labor of love and it is, 
I guess, like one of the most exciting projects I've been able to be a part of. In addition, it reached three different number one uh, lists on Amazon. I was blown away. I completely did not see that coming. Uh, so it's been, a, it's been a really wild ride during COVID, uh, releasing a book and, uh, and hopefully watching others find as much interest and passion as I do with this topic. Uh, so if you happen to have it, thank you guys so much for uh, purchasing it. I've got a ton of free content on this uh, book uh, out there. So one of the things you can go grab is all of the code and resources that are part of the book. And I'll make sure to provide links to that afterwards because I don't actually have them on my copy paste to, to drop them. Uh, but every single example in this book is available open source for free. So you guys can get your hands on graph technology and doing cool things, uh, things with graphs. So if that's where you want to go, I'll make sure to provide that by the end. And when we talk about careers, even that amazing introduction you all provided for me, which thank you, that was incredible. I, I remember sitting and listening to other people that I uh, followed and was really enjoying reading their stories. And I was always blown away by what it looked like uh, to get to a certain place that I wanted to be in my career. And so when you kind of peel back what I've had the uh, extremely humbling opportunity to be a part of in the past 10, 12 years, it, it kind of looks like this. Uh, about 2008 is when I finished uh, my undergraduate degree at the College of Worcester in Ohio. I was a swimmer uh, at the, that whole time and had the opportunity to become an academic All-American. And towards the end of that, I received my first NSF grant to go to graduate school uh, for a master's. During that master's degree, uh, I was able to uh, get involved in some really cool and interesting research that led me to getting a second NSF grant to start a PhD in computer science. Really cool stuff that I was getting into and I was really, really glad to see where I was going in my career. Uh, so I did a four-year program. Uh, in a, a, as they mentioned earlier, at the University of Tennessee doing a PhD in computer science. I was at the Center for Intelligent Systems and Machine Learning. I had a great time to be studying machine learning and picking up new technology like graph, an, uh, graph analytics and graph databases. And uh, after that, I had, you know, I really felt like I had all these options. Uh, I was extremely honored and humbled uh, to have, uh, you know, options for, to work at IBM Watson and Apple. But I decided to listen to what I was really passionate about, and I've been on the startup track. Uh, I decided that I didn't want to be a part of big corporations. I wanted to start companies. I wanted to be a part of new initiatives and help grow a community that didn't exist. Since then, uh, I've uh, had the uh, opportunity to be a part of a few patents uh, within the healthcare industry, applying graph technology to solve some of the world's most complicated healthcare problems. I eventually uh, was able to follow along some colleagues and join them here at DataStax, where uh, I'm currently their chief data officer and have this book out there. It's first off, it's really hard for me to tell you guys that because it it's exciting to look at this, but that is absolutely not what the past 12 to 15 years of my life felt like. Not even close. The way that I like to understand and talk about my career is that we have these really exciting moments where for anything you see on this slide, right before it was moments of pain, absolute pain. And it was really hard. And so this is really what I remember about the past 12 to 15 years of my career. Everything that I have been through has been a jungle gym of, of kind of exploring something I thought was really interesting realizing that was a dead end and having to make a sharp turn to try something new. So how I see my timeline looks like what you all are looking at here. And so I'll tell you a few stories of, of what, these things, uh, what these things represent. Going all the way back to undergrad, so we're going to go through the same timeline. And about 2006, 2007 is when in the United States, the healthcare, or not the healthcare, the housing market crashed, in addition to most of our economy. And I was a budding undergraduate graduating in 2008. Uh, first off, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I had a teaching degree and a math degree, but I, I wasn't really sure and I wanted to explore some options. And then our market crashed and some job offers that I thought I was going to go for, they all fell through. And I was staring at April of my graduating year with zero plans for June 1st. And it was extremely scary. Through just having conversations and meeting different people, I mentioned I was in the swim team and uh, I was doing a lot of recruiting still for, yeah, 
Absolutely. The same thing. Um, I'm just looking at someone's chat. It was, it was very fearful at that time to know what I was going to do next. And I, I was recruiting for the swimming team on, you know, still my senior year and talking to upcoming freshmen for the next year. And I met a gentleman who was a professor at East Tennessee State University. And due to the crash, East Tennessee State University had lost some of their applicants or something had happened and they had an opening for uh, an NSF fellowship that was in the general sciences. And if I wanted to continue studying, say math, they would let me in. And I said, well, I've got nothing else to do, so I have to. Uh, East Tennessee State University was only two hours from where I grew up, sounded like a great idea. So I decided to go ahead and, uh, and take it. Now, usually when you see someone who has an NSF degree or NSF grant, it seems like this big illustrious thing. This one completely fell into my lap. It was complete happenstance through networking with people and uh, being a part of an outreach community that I was personally passionate in, which was swimming and recruiting uh, other athletes to come to my university. So in all honesty, that's how I got my first NSF, NSF grant. Now I went to East Tennessee State University and I was going to register for classes as a freshman. And this is the story on how I found graph technology. I went to register for classes. And when you're a first year, you pretty much get the worst pick. And the only class that I could fit in that would also give me credit towards my degree was this class called graph theory. And I was honestly dragging my feet going into that class on the first day, because I honestly thought that this was going to be a whole semester about, uh, you know, bar charts, pie graphs, uh, just general graphs that were more related to business analytics and data visualization. Now, in 2009, there was not that much of an industry out there for doing data visualization like there is today. So this, again, was 10 years ago. Uh, but I remember going to class because I wasn't the kind of kid who read the book before class. And I, I get there and Dr. Teresa Haynes opens up the very first lecture and she's drawing on the board uh, the idea that you are a person and she draws it as a circle or a vertex and you can draw all your friends and you start drawing edges or lines or links between you and the friends that you have. And you can start to talk about in data ways that you and uh, your friends are related through these things called vertices and edges. And the only way I can describe what that felt like was like a moment of enlightenment. The idea to start looking at data and the, the relationships between data instead of looking at it as rows and columns was a whole new way to think about concepts that I had not really seen anywhere before. So that be kind of became my passion during my master's degree. But eventually we're going to get to something that you see here called the scissors incident. Now, during my master's degree, the NSF fellowship I had was to uh, teach alongside at a local, uh, a local elementary school that was uh, a Title IX elementary school. And at the time in the United States, what that means is that all of the students are uh, underprivileged and they are probably on free or reduced lunch and they don't necessarily have much of a, a home or a community around them. And so I was teaching at this school and uh, that was honestly as a math, a math degree, a, a math person with a teaching degree, the, the career I thought that I was going to be doing. And the last day that I ever taught was when a student uh, you know, had a, a, a moment or had a breakdown in the classroom and was throwing scissors at me and all the other students. And you wanna talk about fear? Uh, it was extremely scary to be in the room at that time. And that was the day I realized that there was no way that I was going to be ready as a, you know, a young professional to be a part of the school system uh, in, that, in that area. So I've been studying and working towards uh, becoming a teacher this whole time. And I just realized that what I prepared my, what I thought was the rest of my life to do was not something I was going to be capable to do. And this was, again, about March of the second year of my master's. And I realized that the next step I thought I was gonna take wasn't gonna happen. Uh, to have those moments when you're staring down only two or three months ahead of you, realizing the path you're on is not the right path, it's, it's really humbling. And it really shows you who you are as a person to have to sit down and, and think about what your next step is gonna be. The, the, the short version of that is I did end up going and applying and receiving another NSF grant uh, to go get my PhD, as you all saw. Uh, but here's the kicker. I went to start a PhD in computer science and I did not know how to open a terminal. I didn't know what LS was. I had no idea what Unix was. 
So the first two years I had to catch up from all of the undergraduate curriculum in computer science while also advancing my graduate courses. So I really don't remember two years of my life uh, between 2011 and 2013. It's what I call the black hole because there was so much that I was trying to catch up and it was really intense to be doing that at the same time. But uh, it was a choice I made and I wanted to see it through. At the time I had chosen to focus on graph analytics and distributed graph algorithms. That was what I loved in my master's degree. So I figured I should learn how to do this with code. And I had the opportunity to solve one of the coolest problems I've ever had the chance to work on. And I was, uh, I was helping track identity in telecommunication networks. Super creepy, yes. Uh, but it was fascinating to be able to work with 400, uh, you know, uh, 400 million different uh, cell phone numbers. They're called detail records, all anonymous, of course, by the way. Like this was not, this was not actual information. We didn't know who these numbers were. And it wasn't the quantity of the text message. It was just the graph of this phone number called this person or this phone number at this time. This phone number texted this phone number at this time. That's all the information we had. But I was looking at the behaviors in these networks to try and figure out how an individual over time might decide to change their phone number or switch from like AT&T to Verizon and things like that. And we were kind of studying this whole graph. And there were some really fascinating algorithms that we were writing and approaches uh, that we had teamed up with Oak Ridge to do on their supercomputer, the Kraken at the time. But I have Edward Snowden listened up here because about this time is when he defected from the United States and uh, he, he released some of the information about what was being done uh, you know, for different levels of privacy and uh, information study for the United States citizens. And my research was not directly connected, but clearly looking at the topic, it was somewhat related. So it's March of my third year of my PhD, which is the fifth year of my graduate studies. And I've lost my data. I've lost my focus on what I'm allowed to publish. And this was uh, in your PhD, you have two gates. You have your proposal and your defense. This is post my proposal. So like I have proposed, this is my research plan. I have a few papers out and these are the three more I'm gonna write to finish my PhD. And that's when the, the plug got pulled on everything. I couldn't work on this anymore. I had no more access to the data uh, and I had to pivot and it was hard. Um, and it, what, what really stinks is that there's a few different researchers at the time who were studying this. And now uh, some of the other researchers who were uh, focused in more uh, actually in Europe, uh, they, they, had, they didn't have the same issue that our country, that the United States did. So their work got published uh, this gentleman, I have followed his career. He's got citations all over the place. Uh, he's been doing great. And it's, it's fascinating to watch his research get on the level it is. And I've had like nothing, like no citations, maybe two or three, like definitely like a blip on the academic radar. Uh, and that's, that's, definitely, that's definitely interesting to have to think about uh, just given the who I was and where I was at the time working on the same problem and the two different trajectories that myself and some of the other researchers are on now. The long and short of that was in order to finish my PhD, in case you're curious, I had to write a distributed graph data generator because I knew all of the statistical properties about this data. So I decided to write a program that would generate synthetic graphs and I could still go after and study the algorithms I thought were cool, but it was all now gonna be on synthetic data. Um, but thank goodness I was able to kind of come up with that idea, get that code written and, and finish my PhD six months later than intended, but still finished, which was, you know, I'm really glad I did. After that, I started working at a startup and I have had so many moments in my career where I felt extremely confident and I was teaching or coaching others. And I really had found different ways to lead or form groups. I started a sister's group, uh, very much like Women Who Code, uh, you know, we were teamed up with Lean In and Cheryl Sandbrook at the time to really help uh, address the gap uh, for women uh, in computer science at the University of Tennessee. So I had all of this confidence. But as soon as I stepped foot into the working world, I somehow got silent. I didn't trust myself. I wasn't able to feel like I could speak my truth in a meeting. And I always felt that I was holding myself back. 
you know, when you're sitting in meetings and there's a really interesting discussion happening and you know you have something valuable to contribute, but you're just not raising your hand. That was me for about two or three years at the beginning of my career. And I remember thinking back and almost looking outside myself saying, where are you? Like, who, who is this? You have opinions and you have ideas. You need to step up and you need to start talking about them. It took a while, uh, but now here at Data Stacks, I've been really focusing on uh, how to learn resilience and how to understand that the opinions that I have aren't opinions, they're truth. They're rooted in real concepts that I do value and I do have a reason to believe that they are true and they are worth being heard. And going through all of this and, and kind of learning what it feels like to experience uh, different moments in your career and having to navigate them to make a, the situation different has, has really been a guiding voice and a guiding way to build that resilience and learn to find my voice uh, in my career and be able to share this story with uh, folks like you all. So a bit long, but that is how I see my career. And I think it's really important uh, as you all are looking at different journeys that other people are on, that you realize that any single person, as you kind of look at that really cool, impressive looking resume, they had to navigate some extreme adversity to get there. And I think it's more important to understand what that adversity was, how they thought through it, how they made choices and, and how those decisions happened to get them to the next step, because that's the important part of, of how you navigate a career. It's not necessarily the goals you set for, self, for yourself and what you attain. It's how you navigate the really challenging moments. Uh, so that would be the advice that I would um, give to you all. If you like to read, uh, I'm currently reading a book by Glennon Doyle. It's called Untamed. I hope some of you all out there have read it. I'm in love with this book. It's really fascinating to help learn how to unwrap the different things that you've learned to maybe keep you from speaking up. Uh, so that's a, that's a kind of outside of the technical realm of a book that I would recommend if any of you all are curious about how you kind of understand this about yourself. I'm going to pause here. That was a lot of information about career. And after this, we're going to be taking kind of like a hard right-hand turn into talking about technical topics. Uh, so I would absolutely love for anyone, you know, if you guys had any questions uh, to, you know, kind of ask them now before we make a, before we make a right-hand turn. Um, no questions from me. This is Charlotte, but I did just want to say that I really appreciate this view of your career. That's not the version that we all have on our resume and our LinkedIn, but rather um, you know, the, the sort of like unfiltered and unsanitized you that I think we can all relate to. And yes. that's great. It's hard. That's something. Yeah. It's really hard out there. Um, and I, and I, um, I just, I wish that I'm glad I'm learning it now. I'm glad that I'm learning to recognize that moments of pain and moments of distrust that you build in yourself are the early signals of growth. And learning to recognize that and be able to think deeply about what your core inner truth is so that you can get yourself through it and into the next phase that's going to be more awesome than where you are is a really fun journey to start to recognize in yourself. That's great. I, I really appreciate, you know, um, women leaders like you taking the initiative to just put yourself out there and say, let's all be a little more honest with ourselves. And yeah, stop uh, feeling like we have to represent that that LinkedIn view of ourselves at all times and just be a little more authentic. I love it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I'm, uh, I saw some chats coming in. The book is Untamed by Glennon Doyle. Um, so I am watching them. Uh, I've got it pulled up right here. So if you guys do have questions and you don't want to feel, you know, come off mute and interrupt, you know, please, please put them in the chat because I am following. Um, but yeah, so uh, someone else upvoted. Uh, they said here that an upvote also for Untamed. It's so good. Uh, you can also find a great conversation between her and uh, Brene Brown on Brene's podcast. I apologize, I apologize if I'm saying that wrong. But yeah, that's a great podcast and I haven't listened to it. So thank you for that recommendation. I'll, I'll go ahead and look for it. I'm glad that you guys are finding that version of the story to be comforting. That's so great to hear. It's really hard to to get up and tell your story in front of a bunch of people you don't know. But um, I, I really wish this, you know, I, I'm really glad that you all are finding it useful. Yeah, I, I just want to echo what was already said. Uh, I think it's really brave for you to put yourself out there. And it's, it's, uh, it's really refreshing 
to hear like both sides of the story because so many times you, you see these resumes and you're like, oh, okay, never me. And then uh, you hear the other side and it's like, okay, that's, uh, I, that's actually me as well. <laughs> awesome. I'm so glad. Thank you for saying that. I, I see here someone's about to switch their career while finishing a PhD. That's got to be incredibly hard. Uh, I can, I, you know, I, I wish you the best and just to continue trusting yourself uh, because you know what is best for you. Good luck. That's going to be awesome. I can't wait to see what you do. All right, I will, uh, I will go ahead and move on. I'm, I'm a fan of the really long, awkward pause. I want to make sure I give everyone room to, uh, to get your questions in before we switch topics. But just because we're going to switch topics and start talking about uh, something that I can go on for way too long, uh, if, you do have a, if you do kind of have a thought that comes into your mind, you're like, man, I wish I had asked her that because we were just talking about it, put it in the chat. I have no problem uh, kind of weaving in any kind of topic as we go. Uh, so feel free to keep them coming. I absolutely love it. Thanks for the interaction, guys. This makes, makes it a lot more fun on a Saturday. So as we make a right turn, where we are headed, we are headed into talking about all things data and graph databases and graph technology. And uh, I'm going to do the best I can to make this next section, you know, about 40, 45 minutes max. It'll be way more fun if you guys are asking questions, by the way. So keep them coming. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do two things. I'm gonna try and start at the 30,000 foot view and bring us in from the overall data and data science industry to talk about why graph databases and graph thinking is important for the data industry as a whole. And then as I mentioned at the second little piece here, the meat of this is gonna be talking about the tech water cooler you're gonna find around the graph database space because it's this whole entire plethora of terminology uh, that is really hard to follow, but it came from graph theory and the mathematicians are really fun with naming things like trees and galaxies and stars. Uh, it's a very visual uh, way to work with data. So hopefully you all start to find some of the, some of the concept as entertaining as I do. The way that I see the relevance coming for graph databases within the data industry is that graph databases help us solve the third most critical feature about data. All data occurs at a certain time and there's context around where that data occurred like a location. But the real context that we think about as humans is that all data also has a relation. There's a context about that piece of information connecting an event or a person at a place at a certain time. And it's that relationship about your data that gives you the context that we so humanly interpret as we think about information. Graph databases are the way that technologists, companies, and the data industry are starting to bring that relationship and that context into tech and into working with data. And the first thing to note is that graphs are not new. We are applying technology to an area of mathematics that has existed, I believe, since the 1700s. Uh, and it started with the famous bridge of Konings, uh, Konigsberg problem, and I apologize if I'm saying that wrong as well. Uh, but there was just a very fascinating problem that laid out four different land masses and the seven bridges that went around them to figure out if it was possible to traverse the bridges exactly once and still end up on every land mass. That problem gave a new way to start to study data and to study specifically the relationships between data. And ever since then, we've had the emerging field of graph theory and mathematics. And in the past 10 years or so, we have seen a lot of innovation in graph database technology. The 10 year, I would say the 10 year window I'm referencing here is usually the innovation to adoption window that you have in technology once there's some major invention and major release of new ways to work with data before you see wide adoption. And that's actually repeated itself a few times. The original, I think most of us when we use databases, we think about using things like MySQL, Postgre, using the SQL query language. 
And the original paper for uh, the relational algebra application that was written and has escaped my mind at this moment, I apologize. Uh, the original paper came out in 1970, but it wasn't until the 1980s that we saw the, the, the adoption of relational databases and SQL really start to take off. So there was that 10 year gap. We saw that 10 year gap again between about the 1990s and the 2000s when we had the invention of the web and a whole new volume, size, speed, and shape of data coming about for connecting over HTTP and working with JSON that, that came about with the web in the 90s, but then not really having NoSQL technology available to work with it until the early 2000s. So these 10 year lags in database innovation or in you know, data innovation are really common in our industry. So the point that I'm looking at is about 2010, we had a, a few different vendors or a few different inventions come into the scene for new ways of working with graph data and graph databases. That's when we really saw Neo4j start, which is one of the most popular graph databases. In addition to another company called Aurelius who invented the Titan graph database. That really took off in 2010. And so right now we're experiencing that 10 year lag of wanting to see, well, how is this technology being adopted and how are people are using it? And that's why it's on the rise. And it's definitely starting to find a really fascinating home and some examples I can't wait to talk with you about as we get into the tech water cooler. What I hope to show you in the rest of this is that graph databases and thinking about the relationships in your data mirror how each of us think. And it mirrors how we contextualize our lives outside of tech. You can think about yourself and your family, and that immediately builds your first star graph, as we would say, where you're the center and you have all your family members around you and you have these edges from you out to all of your most connected and closest family members. You can maybe go to LinkedIn even right now and you can search for me, Denise Gosnell, and you'll see a badge that pops up and it'll say if we're already connected, it'll be a first connection. So you know already that we have that relationship and in your mind, you think I'm directly connected. That badge could say a two. So now you're gonna think, okay, there is a friend I have in common with Denise and you're gonna to start to picture that in your mind. And LinkedIn even helps contextualize that for you by giving you that mutual connection section. So now you start to see what friends we have in common, maybe how we know each other, what era of your life was this from? Again, because all data has a time, a location, and a relationship. The fact that graphs give you the way to work with data the same way you think about it is, is why I absolutely love uh, and will forever find a way to make my career working with this, this technology because it's something that I just find to bring a little bit of humanity to the work that I have, the, the real honor to get to do every day. When you do get started with new tech though, it can be extremely intimidating. I remember when I first started getting working with uh, blockchains and trying to understand smart contracts and all of these different things that happen within the blockchain space, I was completely overwhelmed and intimidated by trying to get started. So what I would like to help you all do in the next little bit here is understand the three main sections of technology that you have within the graph database or the graph space that when you go to Google and start researching, so that you can understand the three main areas of innovation or the three main things you might wanna to stitch together to start working with graphs. That journey is gonna be seeing the data, understanding the data, and then using it. And those three spaces are gonna start with graph visualization and then moving into graph analysis so that you can understand what's important about all the connections around your data. And then once you really understand what's most valuable and what those important connections are, you usually go to the last tier, which is a graph database, so that you can use that data in a production application or in something new that you are interested in building. So I'm going to hold on here just for a minute in case anyone has some questions about uh, the relevance of the data industry and graph databases before we start into our journey of going through graph viz, graph analysis, and uh, graph databases. I mean, no worries if there's no questions. I just want to make sure I make lots of room for them.
Sounds good. We will just keep on plowing through. Okay, so for the first one, graph visualization. Let's look at it because this is where stuff starts to get really fun, in my opinion. When you uh, very first get started with looking at graphs, these are the first six terms or five terms here uh, that you're going to really run into so that you'll want to make sure you have uh, an image in your head. So for these next three sections, by the way, I have a goal. That goal is to give you a term from the graph industry and either get to, uh, yes, uh, if, if I don't get enough examples on how graph theory helps solve complex problems, please let me know. I've worked with hundreds of teams all over the world uh, and can tell lots of stories. Uh, so if we want to end up going in that direction, it might not be what I have on here. We can definitely talk about it. Uh, so my goal with this section here, the next three sections, is to give you a term and then also kind of either give you uh, a definition of it or a picture to associate in your mind so that you can start to build up that confidence to work in the, the graph database space. So these are the first five terms. The first one we're going to talk about are vertices or nodes. So these are going to be the circles that you work with uh, or the nodes that you work with as you're using uh, graph technology. Neo4j primarily uses the word nodes. Vertices is the term that mathematicians use. Over time, one of these will probably win, but right now you hear vertices and nodes equally. I'm pointing to a really large vertex here on this graph. So uh, for applications, let's talk about what this graph is. You are looking at actually an image that is on the gallery wall behind me in my office. Uh, this is the digital version of that print. This is the top 50,000 doctors in the United States. And all data has a time, a location, and a relation. So let's talk about time, location, and relation for the 50,000 doctors in the United States. The time is that these are the top 50,000 doctors from the year 2016. The location is their practice location. So each one of these doctors is geoplotted according to the lat long of where their practice is. The relation or the edges are the patients that these doctors shared in common during that, during that year. The size of the vertex is where things start to get really interesting. I made a visual, I mean, this visualization we made with a, a fellow teammate of mine, Alec McCray. We size these vertices according to the total amount of reimbursement that they received from the US government in that calendar year. So this really large vertex is the guy who took the most money from the government. It also was illegal. What he was doing was fraudulent. So a visualization of this data and plotting it immediately starts to tell a story about what is happening down here in Miami, Florida. And it turns out that this was a doctor who had retired, but people were illegally using his NPI or kind of like your social security number of the healthcare industry. They were illegally using it for pathology results. And he individually had, re had taken $20.2 million from the government in one calendar year. This guy is now in jail. So it's just very fascinating to realize by looking at this data and adding one dimension to it, the relationships, you can see fraud in your industry in a whole new light. This information had been in front of us this whole time, but by adding in relationships and adding in say a few more data sets, we were able to give enough forensic evidence uh, to tell a story that was able to put this gentleman behind bars for fraudulent use of the medical Medicare industry. And Pardon me, yes, we will get to knowledge graphs in the graph database section, so that's coming for sure. The next term are edges or links, which you guys already started to visualize. Uh, the edges or links are drawn up here just as lines <clears throat> on this image, and that's the second main piece that you're going to start to see when you're working with graph data. The other item to consider are clusters. Clusters are exactly the same that we would reference within the general data science industry. It's going to be groups of vertices or edges that are related to each other. And this is a, another visualization from the healthcare industry. And you can see that we kind of have very specific clusters here that are forming around this image. These image were, uh, these vertices were clustered around similar doctors. So the clusters that you're looking at on this image are doctors with similar specialties. The cluster I'm pointing to is, uh, I do believe, uh, therapy, like physical therapy and behavioral therapy. The hairball cluster, the largest one, we do call them hairball clusters. The hairball cluster there is the cluster that represents general practice, uh, you know, primary physicians, secondary, uh, and, and general practitioners there. There's not a lot of structure because 
the general medicine practice, which is represented in that cluster is not as well defined as behavioral therapy, physical therapy, and things like that, that you'll see uh, around the other image. And I'm glad that you all find hairball to be a fun term because these are the terms I get to say all day professionally. So, um, a great question that just came in. Where can we find out more about this use case and the data that was used? I work at the DOJ, so I'm always looking for data related to criminal justice and the graph looks great. Awesome. I'm glad that you love these graphs. Um, if I can think, I, I wrote a lot about this and at the startup I was working at, I might be able to dig up some old blogs, but this data is available on uh, the Medicare's website. If I can find it, I'm in the Slack channel. Um, so if you guys, if someone can keep me honest with all these questions and links, I promise that I'm going to find for you all. Um, I can drop them in the Slack channel after this talk. Uh, but this data is freely available from, uh, you know, from our the United States Medicare. And the tool that I'm using to do this visualization is called Gephi. Now, Gephi is like the old school academic way to do graph visualization. But Gephi is the only tool I have found to be able to handle uh, making high quality, high resolution, Im high resolution images with hundreds of thousands of data points in one graph. So it's kind of a dead project at this point because it is an open source project. Uh, but there is a Gephi users group on Facebook. I totally just dated myself and I'm just, yeah, whatever. It's fine. It's who I am. Uh, but there's a Gephi users group on Facebook who uh, they constantly are posting their graph visualization. So I recommend if you are into that, that you pick up Gephi. Uh, what, uh, are there graph clustering algorithms? Yes, they are. And we're going to visualize and talk about some graph clustering algorithms in the analysis section in the next one. So we will get to those. Thanks, Nicole, for posting Gephi. You found it, that was great. When you're looking at edges, so kind of going back into terms that you're gonna find for, uh, that you're gonna find for, uh, ooh, okay, I see a second for Anne's question before I move on and I missed Anne's question. Wasn't the node size enough without info on the relationships on the doctor graph? Yes, the node size was enough. It was the relationships of the patients in common that helped tell this story and figure out why and how that doctor was illegally using the system. So these edges were their patients in common. And uh, the patients that you can see here are not geographically central to just that area. There are some reasons that people would fly, say to the Mayo Clinic or other popular hospitals around the country, but there was enough activity here to start to dig in and say why. So it was these relationships that gave that forensic data-driven evidence that helped uh, actually qualify, or I'm using the wrong words there, but actually put this gentleman behind bars. Thanks for the seconding on the question. I didn't mean to miss it. Awesome. Glad, glad to see it. Yes, uh, someone else also works in the corner of this medical industry on Medicare Advantage side. Yes, and there's probably a lot of terrible ways in which uh, you can look at the claims on Medicare Advantage and find that people potentially are illegally using the system. Uh, so more healthcare stories we can get into for sure. It's just funny that you bring this up because that is um, that is literally what I do at my day job. Um, oh, how great! It's yeah, it's pretty. Sorry to sidetrack. I just got really excited when I saw you were looking at Medicare fraud. I was like, oh my god, um, this is super relevant. But you know, for medi for those of you who don't know, which I think is probably everyone, the Medicare Advantage side of the industry, the fraud that happens, or I'm sorry, the inaccurate data submissions to the government. Um, on that side of the industry is more related to uh, diagnosis codes yeah. that the, the doctors give members. And so um, the fraud detection algorithms there are just, or I'm sorry, inaccurate data detection algorithms on that side are just not as well built out. So that's that's something we're trying to do right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway. So pro tip, I did some really cool research for Aetna where we were looking at overpayments and underpayments. And there's some, uh, there is uh, some outlier connections that you can find using a graph between ICD codes and uh, what are the diagnosis codes? ICD is what you bill for, but the diagnosis ones, I'm not remembering. So um, ICD can be uh, either procedure or diagnosis. Yeah. Uh, okay. CPT is usually procedure. That's what I meant. That's CPT. That be, yeah. Yep. Thank you. Um, when you map out uh, your doctor's MPI and the claim and the CPT and the ICDs, uh, what you can find on some of the outliers of that graph are where overpayments and underpayments happen from uh, certain doctors, some of which potentially end up being fraudulent uses. So 
I would recommend for digging into fraud uh, with graph databases and, and Medicare looking there. That sounds super awesome. And if you're able to um, supply like any sort of link or blog post about that, I would really appreciate it. Cool. We'll put that on the list for things that I can provide afterwards. Yeah, let me second. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, let me talk on the graph databases for anomaly detection. I'm not familiar with that, but that sounds very interesting um, since I do a lot of anomaly detection type work with financial data. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And some of the anomalies that you're going to find uh, end up structurally being on the other side of what we call a bridge here. Uh, so I love hearing that anomaly detection and fraud are, are areas that you see graph databases coming into play because absolutely. Uh, that is where uh, we're currently using graph databases in the insurance space at DataStax to help them detect fraud. Uh, and yes, also used widely in cybersecurity, which is the where I got started with my PhD. Tracking identity across telecommunication networks really was for a cybersecurity application. So a bridge, as you can see here, uh, a bridge is going to be an edge that connects two clusters or even two individual vertices together. So if you were to remove that bridge, you're going to disconnect the data from being connected to the main section. So you can start to see now how the mathematicians were kind of fun with how they named these terms. Bridge goes away, you've got two islands that end up getting formed. And what is very interesting when you're working within the graph visualization space is how you can lay out the data and tell, com and tell two completely different stories. Both data sources you're looking at are the same data. We colored them differently, we put them in a different layout, and you got two totally different stories about them. So both of these graphs are looking at the top 50,000 doctors and their information about their, geo, uh, about their location and the patients they share in common. The one on the left is clustered uh, according to uh, a, a minimum crossing algorithm, uh, which is uh, an algorithm, it's coming up in the next section. Uh, but it's just trying to uh, lay out the data so that the edges cross as little as possible and you end up with these clusters. But the image on the right, you end up, uh, we, we plotted it according to the practice location, the lat long, and you get two totally different stories off of these images. One, you can start to talk about how some doctors are, you know, roughly associated and related to other doctors according to their specialty. And the one on the right, we end up getting into this really sweet conversation about fraud. So. When you start getting into working in data visualization, if you decide to pick up Gephi, there's a whole world of layouts that you're going to start to get into because depending on how you orient your data, you end up getting a completely different view and you get lost for hours. Uh, yes, a cluster is a collection of nodes, but perfect. Um, great, great, great definition. I love that. Uh, yeah, so once, uh, when you have graph data that's laid out differently, they're all called isomorphic. Uh, but they all represent the exact same structure. You're just looking at them differently. So that's going to be most of the work that you get into if you start looking into graph visualization. If that's something that you find really interesting, here's a uh, kind of a layout of a bunch of tools. Uh, there's a beautiful uh, source or a beautiful series of posts about this by Elise on Medium. So I have the link here on the slide for those of you who are following uh, along uh, the actual version on Google Slides as I'm presenting. In the comments, you'll find the link, uh, the link to her blogs are absolutely great. So that was a section on graph visualization. So let's go on and talk about graph analysis where you're gonna begin to find some of the first uh, algorithms that you're gonna wanna use. Once you, uh, what's a bridge? Is that a type of edge or a relationship? So a bridge is a specific type of edge where that edge uniquely connects one vertex to another vertex. So if you were to remove the bridge, you would end up disconnecting the graph or you would end up with a set of vertices that are no longer connected together. So a bridge is that last little lifeline you have for getting from one cluster or one vertex to another part of the graph. Thanks for the question, awesome. Once you start to structure your data like a graph, because you find it really fascinating to work with it, the next thing you're gonna probably wanna do is understand what's important about these connections across your, the full topology or the full surface area of, of, your, of your connections or that hairball, like what's important in there. And this is gonna to begin to step you into the world of graph analysis. Graph analysis is incredible. And we could have an entire, you know, you honestly, you could study graph algorithms for a PhD. So there's, there's anything from a five minute intro, which is what we're about to get to a full lifelong career on studying graph analysis. 
So my goal here is to give you an image in your head to understand these five most common things that you're gonna to wanna to do when you start your graph analysis so you know where to get started and what might be where you wanna what you wanna explore about your first uh, about your first graph. We've already been looking at one of them. It's clustering. And clustering is very popular within the data science community. And clustering is another way that you're going to first want to look at your graphs. Uh, and some of the different ways you might want to cluster them are in different algorithms. So let's talk about a few different graph uh, algorithms to cluster your data. Uh, but we're going to use Twitter for this next series of examples because Twitter is just a massive graph that we use all the time. So for this example, what you see here uh, is uh, Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. Uh, Barack Obama is an important vertex on Twitter because Barack Obama is the most popular. Uh, he's the most followed vertex on Twitter, which gives us our first clustering algorithm, centrality. Centrality gives you a way to organize all of your data according to their degree. So this is specifically degree centrality. Barack Obama, as I mentioned when I made this slide, had the most followers on Twitter at you know, 122 million uh, followers. So he is the most central, highest degree vertex on Twitter. The degree of a vertex is just the number of edges that touch it. So the degree of Barack Obama is 122.4 million. And then we have Michelle Obama over here as well with 16.8 million. That's going to come up for another type of uh, algorithm. That algorithm we can talk about is PageRank. PageRank is also how Google works. PageRank is talking about the overall relevance of an individual vertex, not solely based on the number of edges that touch that vertex, but by the amount of influence that that vertex has according to who also follows that vertex. So for this example that we're looking at here, Barack Obama is going to be the most central vertex, but if he had 122.4 million followers who all only maybe had one or two other followers, he wouldn't be that influential of a vertex in Twitter's graph. But folks like Michelle Obama, they have a massive following. They also follow Barack Obama. So that's a way to see that the overall influence of this vertex, the Barack Obama vertex in Twitter's graph, is much more influential because they are also followed by highly influential people. So PageRank is an algorithm that will iteratively go through and update your, the value, the rank of your vertex by initializing it with the total number of edges that, uh, that follow that vertex and then iteratively updating it according to the influence of everyone in your neighborhood. And eventually, this algorithm will converge to having the top most ranked vertex in your graph. I personally have not run this in Twitter in a long time because Twitter is huge. So if there's anyone out there who's very interested in downloading all of Twitter and determining its current page rank, it's an awesome open challenge that has not been done in a while. Uh, the last way that we use this is for recommendations. Uh, so uh, in my book, at the very end, in the last three chapters, 10, 11, and 12, I walk you guys through how to do recommendations exactly the way that they show up for Netflix. Netflix is one of Data Stacks' first customers and their recommendation engine is awesome. The way this works is that if you, the blue Twitter logo here on the slide, currently follow Michelle Obama, what we're going to also look at are all of the followers that Michelle Obama has and then the other folks on Twitter, which they follow. And, follow, and using that path, you follow Michelle, these people also follow Michelle, this group of people follow Barack Obama or other folks, that's where you get your series of recommendations from on Twitter, on Netflix, on pretty much any social media platform. Uh, it's essentially doing graph-based collaborative filtering. And what we just walked through is called item-based collaborative filtering. So if you have any curiosity of how we do this at Netflix, uh, that is some of the code that I provide and show you all at the very end of uh, at the Practitioner's Guide to Graph Data. The last term that you're gonna see a lot when you're doing graph analysis is scale-free. Now this area is moving away from clustering and away from how you're gonna analyze the topology of who follows who or what's connected to what and it's trying to understand 
the total distribution of the degree of your graph. Remember, degree is a vertex and the number of edges that touch that vertex. These degree distributions are trying to figure out how many vertices do you have in your graph that have a ton of connections? How many vertices in your graph only have a few? And that's where you're starting to find the scale-free distribution. Almost every natural graph is a scale-free distribution. So if you're working with real data, putting it into a graph structure, I would bet a lot of money that the structure of that graph is gonna follow this image you see on the slide. So when you think of scale-free, I want you to see this elbow curve. What this means is that most natural graphs have very few vertices that are extremely high con highly connected. The majority of the vertices in your graph are gonna have only a few connections. And that's very evident on Twitter where you only have a few people who've reached that insane, highly connected level of following. The majority of us, the majority of folks who use Twitter only have a few connections. Uh, yes, it's, it's very close to a power law distribution. Uh, it's alpha X to the negative beta, which pretty much is a power law. Um, so yes, they're pretty much the same. Great question. And uh, here's also what a scale-free graph is gonna look like, going back to our specialty clustering of our uh, top 50,000 physicians in the United States. That hairball cluster there is actually a cluster of lowly connect or of, of uh, very low connected, low degree vertices. Your like the, the highly connected area is the cluster in the center uh, upper right. This, this one right here, if you all can see my mouse, this is the cluster up here that represented behavioral therapy and, uh, and mental health services and behavioral services. I was actually really excited to see this graph because uh, the, the type of patients that we had created for this referral network were looking directly into the types of healthcare services that were booked online. So to see that the behavioral services and therapy were one of the top ranked services for uh, e-commerce care and for looking and booking healthcare service providers on online. It was, it was very heartwarming to see that people are much more likely to go out and get the healthcare services that they need when you're able to search for a provider online instead of have to ask for that personal recommendation. So within the healthcare space online, uh, it's, you're definitely, there's definitely an upward trend for making sure that you receive that behavioral care that you need, which was kind of a feel good moment when we were looking at the early signs of this about four or five years ago. If you want to get into graph algorithms and graph processing, uh, again, going back to Elisa's post series on median, the links are in the slides. Here is the kind of suite of vendors that you're going to find out there in this space. Neo4j uh, has the lion's share right now of the market. Most people turn to them to get started. I think that their, their tools and their information is absolutely excellent. So if you're new, that's a great place to start. I personally work at Datastacks where we're using Datastacks Graph and Titan and a few other types of, uh, types of processes, but I like to call it honest on really great getting started material. And I think Neo4j does an excellent job. All right, so last section, graph databases. Uh, this is where you are going to start to find a lot of the information out there about knowledge graphs, semantic graphs, property graphs. It's, it's moving from the concepts of working with your data like a graph into needing to pick up the proper tool to work with it in a production application. At least that's how I like to reason about it. I like to reason that the journey from graph visualization to graph analysis to graph databases kind of follows a little bit of a maturity funnel. Uh, it's, it's loose though, it's not an exact science, but it's a little bit of a maturity funnel for what you're gonna need when you're getting started. All right, so there's two main types of graph databases, semantic graph databases and property graph databases. Pardon me, semantic graph databases have been around a little bit longer. Semantic graph databases are much more connected to the NLP community. So when you're working with semantic graph databases, it's all about taking a corpus of text, a bunch of documents and extracting triples. 
you're looking for nouns, verbs, and, uh, and predicates so that you can kind of crawl all of the information across your corpus and model them as a graph. So cat hunts mouse is the example I have here on the slide. You're gonna use specialized languages like Sparkle to infer context across all of these documents in a different type of structure so that you are able to understand topics that exist inside your corpus. So that's a whole nother world. Yes, the NL com NLP community is representing, they are here. And absolutely, if you're in the NLP community, you're gonna probably wanna go after semantic graph databases. <laughs> I love it, I love the energy. Uh, I personally have been working a lot more in the other community. Uh, I come from working within the property graph community where uh, we're thinking more like the traditional modeling sense of using ERDs uh, in relational databases and modeling all of that within a graph database. Most of my book, all of my book actually, focuses on examples in the property graph database space. What you see here on the upper left-hand part of the slide is an ERD representing how customers could own certain bank accounts. And we invented and proposed a language for doing this in graph databases in the book. And that's what you see on the lower right-hand corner where you're essentially translating a customer table to a customer vertex. You're taking the owns joining table into an owns edge and then the account table into an account vertex. And the property graph models, if you're much more used to working with ERDs, you're gonna find yourself to be more naturally following into the property graph model. What does ERD stand for? Entity relationship diagram. Whew, <laughs> I could remember that on a Saturday. Uh, yeah, so an ERD is an entity relationship diagram. They are, that was what came out in, the, pap in the, the paper that was invented in the 1970s with the original, uh, the original models of how to use relational technology. This also brings us to knowledge graphs. Knowledge graphs are seeing an emergence in, in the industry now. You're looking at an image of a knowledge graph from Google in 2015. And the knowledge graph is trying to bring together what the semantic graph community is doing alongside the property graph community and do it all in one graph. You wanna represent all of knowledge. It doesn't matter if it's coming from a corpus of documents or structured data sources. You want to bring that all together in one. And pardon me, I need to take a sip of water. Okay, thanks guys. When we are looking at knowledge graphs, you are bringing together all of the different types of data sources into one graph because you want to kind of model your entire domain. I will say that I have seen people fall in the knowledge graph trap a few times over the past 15 years. I personally am saying that from having fallen in the knowledge graph trap. I was down in there and it was scary. What I mean by that is that knowledge graphs represent how we think about everything in the world. And it makes so much sense to try and model everything about your domain in a graph, irrespective of its data source. The trap is that for doing this at a business or within a company, there, la there tends to be a lack of specificity of what you're trying to do and what you're modeling and what the business outcome is you're driving towards. So I have a little bit of caution as you go and approach knowledge graphs uh, that you wanna make sure that there's a specific problem that you're aiming to model and you're aiming to solve. Typically the problems have one of four shapes. You have neighborhoods, like you wanna unify all of your data sources together into this one entity and everything about them or you have hierarchies, like uh, your GitHub commit tree is a, is a hierarchy or your uh, company structure from your CEO to your VPs, that's a hierarchy. The third most common shape of pattern is doing pathfinding, just like we talked about with LinkedIn, who are the connections that get me connected to this other person? You know, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon problem. And the fourth most common shaped problem for graphs is the recommendation engines, where you want to do collaborative filtering by just doing a walk and counting. So have caution with knowledge graphs. And if you wanna pick up uh, knowledge graph information and go in that direction for your company or for your next project, my number one piece of advice is gonna have specificity over what you're looking for so that you don't fall in that same pit of trying to solve everything and therefore not solving anything and your project get, uh, not getting sponsored anymore. There's a few times that I have mentioned uh, um, you know, actually I haven't mentioned this yet, but when you're working in the semantic 
and knowledge graph community, you're going to hear the word ontology a lot. Ontology just means words. And the ontology is talking, ontologies are talking about uh, the words that you're going to use to talk about a certain domain. You've heard us using on this call today the ontology about the healthcare industry. We've been talking about patients and NPIs and uh, Medicare. What you do when you're working with graph databases is you typically find your business users sitting together with your data engineers and you're writing code that allows you to use your graph data in the business context that, it, that it's meaningful. And so you're building up an ontology or a domain specific language. When you use your graph data, you're going to be traversing it or you're gonna be writing traversals. And that's a very visual way to just say that you're gonna start somewhere in your data and you're gonna walk around it to get somewhere else. All of the academics and a lot of the papers and blogs that are written out there just mention this as a traversal instead of like a query or a lookup. So whenever you see traversal, just think and imagine yourself walking through all of the relationships in your graph data. And I think when I was on the, on the, uh, on the, the knowledge graph slide, I mentioned a common pattern of neighborhoods or you know, connecting all of your data together into one source. That's what we call a neighborhood in the graph community. So it starts to get very friendly because your vertex has a bunch of neighbors and your first neighborhood is all of the vertices that are directly connected to you. Your second neighborhood are the vertices connected to those vertices and so on and so forth. So graph terms can have a lot of friendly, uh, friendly connotations. I also mentioned trees earlier. Uh, we were talking about the hierarchy of your organization, how CEOs and VPs and directors are organized together. And so this is a tree or a hierarchy. And I've mentioned paths as well on LinkedIn. So when I personally look at Tim O'Reilly on LinkedIn, this is what I see. I see that I am a second connection to Tim O'Reilly, which means that there's me, a group of people, and then Tim O'Reilly. And I can look down into the mutual connections between myself and Tim O'Reilly to start to understand how I could know him. And this is an example of how we use paths every day in an application, uh, namely in uh, LinkedIn. If you wanna get started on graph databases, the space is very full. There's a ton of uh, vendors out there. I personally work at DataStacks. I use DataStacks Enterprise Graph because I'm solving a lot of the uh, problems that are like Netflix size. We need massive amounts of nodes uh, in, uh, you know, in a cloud, like hundreds of thousands of machines in order to store all of this data in a massive graph. Uh, but there are plenty of other graph databases to get you started. I've mentioned Neo4j before. You're gonna find a lot out there about Tiger Graph. Uh, those are some of the three more popular ones, but there's plenty of them out there. A uh, link to Elise's blog is also uh, shown on this slide. Seeing that we, you know, we have about 12 minutes left or so, I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of hold on the presentation because I did see a lot of questions and comments come through and I do wanna answer them, but also uh, pass it back to the organizers for this session. Uh, so I'm gonna come over here, starting back up with uh, Nick's question. Looks like that is it. Yeah, so next question, if customers have poor data definition and a non-unified organizational schema, is there a tooling for edge discovery? That's, um, that's a very interesting question, Nick. I don't know if I fully understand maybe where you're going with that, but you might just be talking about how to model, model your data potentially. Uh, so Nick, if you might wanna clarify that, that would be very helpful. Uh, for you know, answering, answering that question. If you are just talking about modeling your data, uh, my recommendation is that uh, you're gonna wanna model your graph data the way you talk about it. So the way you talk about your domain and you talk about your business, you wanna, you wanna write those queries of how you wanna get information, write them down, and that's gonna help you see what, uh, what, a, what a vertex is gonna be or what an edge is gonna be. So the one example I had up here was a customer owns a bank account. So the nouns are your customer and your bank account. So those are probably your main entities and owns is a verb. And that's how you think relation, like that's the relationship between a customer and account. So if I need to follow up on that, Nick, please let me know. Uh, Leslie was commenting on e how ERDs can be super helpful for communicating on full stack. Absolutely. Um, they are very helpful. And, it, and uh, to Nick's question about uh, modeling your graph data, there's not a very solid ERD for the graph database space. I talked through how I would like to see an, an ERD get put together in chapter two of my book. 
it's a proposal. We'll see where it goes in the community. I don't expect it to become a thing, but uh, I, I would love to see the graph database community start to harden how we model graph data. Uh, Paula has to say this trap sounds a lot like the problem. So we were talking about knowledge graphs and like falling in the pit of the knowledge graph trap. So the trap sounds like the problem that a lot of it, that uh, a lot of attempts to integrate semantic web into their systems are, are and they're not getting much out of it. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the semantic the semantic graph community uh, there there tends to be a lot less specificity. But I'm also I'm dangerously not uh, well involved in that community. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Jean uh, Juan Cicada, does a ton of really great work on it. So. Uh, find him on LinkedIn, follow his content. He's one of the leaders in the semantic uh, industry and can absolutely help you out. What are some of the questions, Nicole asked, what are some of the questions that you tend to get from a non-technical clients when implementing a graph solution? I have not had that question before. That's a very interesting question. Um, honestly, I think the first one I get is why does it take so long? Um, the, that tends to graph projects. I mean, graph technology is new and just like using any new technology, uh, it takes a significant amount of time to teach people how to use it. And that tends to be the number one point of contention for the non-technical users in the room, especially those who are financially supporting the project. Going down to the next question, what are some of the most secure graph databases that organizations with sensitive data might look into? Um, Personally, the only graph database that I understand well enough is the one that I represent. Um, so when I get asked questions about specific graph databases and vendors, I don't feel comfortable making recommendations because I know how deeply I work with Datastax graph and the security uh, items that we have in place, but I don't have that same depth with Tiger graph or Neo4j. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna punt the vendor question because I don't feel that I have enough information to well represent the full industry. I hope that's okay. Oh, awesome, Paula, glad to see that your GraphDB is on the list. That's great. Uh, okay, so will you cover how to think about re reframing transactional tabular series data into a graph structure? Um, yes, I would love to. And that is a really long conversation and I see I have a few minutes left. Um, so the way that I start to think about reframing, you know, transactional and tabular series data into a graph structure is I always like to start with my questions. I always think about the data source that I have and the most valuable information I need to extract from that source. And I use that as my guiding, um, kind of like my guide to, the, to what I need to focus on modeling and, and, uh, and, and where I need to, to make sure that I'm spending a lot of time cleaning and well representing the data in, in my source. So um, I, hope, I hope that helps. I, I start with the questions and I look at the nouns and the relationships that naturally exist in the domain I'm modeling and I use that to do the, to do the modeling. As a um, follow-up, does that mean like you could model the same data in so many different ways and depending on how you represent it, you get different answers out of it. Is that what you're saying? Yes, okay. yes you would. Helpful. And um, yes and it's the biggest debate that you're gonna get into with your team. Uh, graph databases really find themselves in the intersection between art and science and people think about things differently. And uh, I, I essentially sometimes feel like I'm a, 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 de a debate controller when I, when I, it's a Saturday, I don't have a good word for that, but I feel like I'm off, I often come in just to help bring the team down a little bit after they've been arguing for a few weeks on what to do with their graph data. Um. Is it also the case that it often is time consuming and slow to implement a design, hence the debate beforehand? Absolutely. And it, yes, it absolutely is because you're usually working with brand new languages. Uh, personally, okay. I use the Gremlin okay. query language and it's a functional programming language that takes a long time to learn. Uh, so yes, that, that absolutely is a, tends, to be a, tends to be a part of it. Okay. I promised, uh, I promised Naomi that I would leave time and uh, I have gone 10 minutes over my promised point. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, go ahead and stop here, but we have a ton of questions. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy all these questions and I'm gonna go into the Slack uh, room that you all have set up and I will um, do what I can to type some answers. Thank you so much. I mean, they can listen to me almost any day of the week and they can find me on YouTube if they really wanna hear about women who code. So 
you know, um, we really appreciate your time here today. It's been really special. I'm really glad that everyone's having great conversations going in a lot of different directions. Uh, yeah, it's been really amazing. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen and let people know what else is coming up soon. Uh, here in data science. So coming back out of this amazing graph session and thinking about data science overall, here's what's happening next in our track. Um, one of our amazing leads is launching a data visualization um, series of workshops in November. So you can see the overview here. Um, we're going to be releasing each workshop on its own in a little visual. You can find it in the Slack channel. It's some really great content coming up, moving from R to Python, Tableau, BI, all kinds of things about data visualization running almost all the way up to Christmas. The other thing that I would like to share with you, which I'm very excited about, is um, this build your own crypto wallet event. It is going to be a Halloween spooktacular. So even if you have not touched blockchain before, we would encourage you to dress up from like shoulders up, um, noting our inclusive conduct note. So let's get cute, let's get fun, let's get sparkly, but you know, hold it there. Uh, and you will be able to actually build your own crypto wallet with Sydney Live from OutSystems. It's gonna be super fun, super interactive, like a lab style. And she's gonna make sure that we kind of all get through that. Um, and then everyone leaves with their own little crypto wallet. So that's on the 29th. It's gonna be a lot of fun. And I think that's, that's our big ones to talk about right now. There are lots of places to follow us. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're in Slack. Um, but if you need to ask anything, Naomi at womenwhocode.com. Simple. So thanks everyone. Um, it's been really great today. I'm going to drop the link here for our Halloween blockchain party. <laughs> Naomi, I just put it in there. <laughs> Did you? Okay. Yeah. I lose my screen, so I don't know. Um, yeah. And are you able to grab the chat, Sapphire? Because mine's not saving the chat. Yeah, I could do that. Um, so Denise Sapphire is going to save the chat, get those questions over to you. Um, and for everyone who is still in here, uh, I believe Denise will be in our data science channel somewhere floating around answering those questions. <laughs> awesome. So you put them in the data science channel. Yes. Cool. Cool. <laughs> I think uh, I think there was only two questions I didn't get to. Uh, so I will talk about how we could transform graph data into a format under uh, that machines can understand for word to vectors algorithms and then can you recommend people groups and keywords and stuff. I'll put some of that in the data science channel. Amazing. Thank you so much. You. It's been amazing. Absolutely. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. I'm so glad that I got to meet you all and be here today. Uh, happy Saturday. Enjoy the rest <laughs> of your days. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.